I start with the text at 8 minutes 10 seconds. Before then is a chit chat about prayer. Hello everyone, Samantha here. This is day 7 of getting to know God better. Day 7. Let us say a word of prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, if you notice, the past couple of days, I have been opening up with prayer. And um, I wanted to share this, but the Lord wasn't releasing me to share it. But I'm going to share it now because I do feel at peace with sharing it. Um, I've done a lot of prayer journaling and, um, you know, on previous videos. And out of nowhere, I started being attacked about praying on praying um, on camera. And as if I was praying to be seen. I'm not going to go into the details of that. But what I started doing was just like, I always pray and I pray off camera. So I don't have a need to come on and pray on camera. And if I did because of what people might think, then I would be going into praying to not be seen. But under that kind of attack, the temptation is to like try to prove yourself. So, of course, I'm praying off camera. But the Lord wouldn't let me pray on camera because he saw that I'm going through and I don't ever want to come on camera and pray and then have to go off and question my motives because that would really, really hurt me. Like, I I don't, I don't like that. And to come under that kind of assault is very, very hurtful because I don't pray to be seen. Um, I pray because God put a prayer on my heart. But anyway, still that, that type of attack does hurt. Because it's like the enemy trying to mess with your head about your motive. So at any rate, I knew I was tempted to try to prove myself. So what the Lord in his infinite wisdom did was he wouldn't let me pray on camera. And it was a testing. And um, I, I knew I prayed off camera. And um, so, you know, we had I had to leave it there. And then, um, then I noticed that, um, you know, he, um, released me the other day to play some music and give some quiet time for, um, you know, to pray more. And if someone, probably someone would enjoy the music in just a moment of, um, no words, just, you know, soft melody. And that was actually piano, instrumental worship music. Then I noticed yesterday he released me to pray on camera. And then I noticed that he had me do a Bible journal page on it. Which was actually the last scripture in the Jesus Journal Junkies um, group. The scripture challenge, the prayer scripture challenge. Because the Lord has been dealing with me a lot on prayer. And had me doing some, some different things here. Um, but I'm not going to go into that. But um which is teaching me about prayer. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to show the journal page here. And, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so that was the last verse. And then the Lord, you know, he just spoke some things to my heart, you know. Um, you know, because I've seen some things, I've seen some things transpire in churches. I've seen... Prayers be compared. I even did something like that before. And the Lord, like, he convicted me. Um, I'm going to um, get in the book in a minute. But it's just on my heart to share this. Um, I remember one time someone I knew was very quiet. And then 
they um, have sent out a prayer um, to several members of a church that I was attending. And I remember I was like, wow, I didn't know they could pray like that, whatever. And the Lord just rebuked me. He was like, who are you to compare somebody's prayer? What do you mean you didn't know he could pray like that? He's talking to me. What is that of you? What is that of your business? And I was like, what? He says to me, this is why a lot of people are afraid to pray out in church because they don't sound like everybody else. And there's so many people that feel like their prayers are going to be judged because they feel like they don't have the right words. They don't have enough words. They don't sound like the pastor. They don't sound like the leaders. They don't sound like this person. They don't sound like that person. And they feel, some of them feel like what they have to say is not valuable. And they don't have that certain kind of octave. And they don't have that certain kind of tone. And they don't know all the Bible Bible words. So they feel like, like, what's the use of praying out loud? I'm going to look stupid. I'm going to, I don't know how to pray. And that's not true. If you know how to talk, you can pray. You talk with the Lord, you know. And so, um, so yeah, the Lord had dealt with me with that. And I realized that I had my own hangups about prayer and it became com it became complicated because of things that I had seen, things that I had heard, things that I had read, which was more about preference and ideal versus the word. And that's why I learned get in the word of God. Because if not, I thank God for preachers. I thank God for teachers and pastors and evangelists and all of us that share the word of God. But we are humans and we make mistakes. We are fallible. We don't always get it right. We miss it. And that's why even though we can learn from each other, we still need to be in the word and praying and asking God for revelation and his understanding. Because we miss it as human beings. We can't just rely on one another. With that being said, I'm going to go into the text. And this is the first day, day seven, I sort of didn't want to share. And I kind of didn't want to share it because there was so much in the insights that I did not agree with. And there um, there was some in the other ones that I just was like, hmm. But when it came to the word of God, I agreed with it. But when it came to the Christian writer, I cannot say that I agree with everything. And it's okay. We do not have to agree with everything with each other or everything someone says. And just because they are famous or Christian classical writer, it don't mean that everything they said was 100% right. They were the ones that went on to be with the Lord human or human. Like. And so with that being said, I'm going to go into day seven and I'm going to share what I don't agree with and why. And this is not to say that, oh, Brother Lawrence is bad. No. He says some good stuff and I know how to take that and say, okay, the other stuff I don't agree with and there's no love lost. So with that being said, I mean, yeah, with that being said, so let me go into it. So day seven, no God's presence, no God's presence. Deuteronomy 1122. Love the Lord your God. Walk in obedience to him and hold fast to him. Hold on one second. Okay. So, I'm going to read that also in the, the King James. Because that was the Deuteronomy. The, um, that was the, um, the NIV version. So, 11.22. <clears throat> okay, so it says, For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave to him. And then it goes into verse 20, 23. Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. But for knowing God's presence, they use the parts of the verses, love the Lord your God, walk in obedience to him, and hold fast to him. 
<clears throat> so here is the insight. And like I said before, I don't necessarily agree with everything he said. And then again, it may be a play on semantics. The way people use words, sometimes a connotation, um, there are different connotations across different contexts. And then it's like, wait a minute here. But then if you were actually able to talk with the person and sometimes dialogue with them and have that discourse, sometimes you'll see that you're saying the same thing, but in a different way, or the person is using that word in a different way. So um, in all fairness, I had to come to that level of maturity by God. Like, you know, if you can't have a dialogue with a person, sometimes you're just taking what they said exactly where it say, and there's no expounding on their behalf. And then you could be really misinterpreting their heart. So anyway, so practicing the presence of God, then he writes, which is very, I think is very respectful in my opinion. He writes, this is in my opinion, the essence of the spiritual life, right? Practicing the presence of God. I feel that way too. And it seems to me that by practicing it properly, you become spiritual in no time. Now, right there, it could be a play on semantics. I believe that the moment a person says yes to Jesus, they become spiritual. They become born again. New life. Old things have passed away. They are new creation in Christ Jesus. So I believe they come, become spiritual at the moment. Those are with, one with the Lord or one spirit. Okay, so that person is spiritual at that point that they say yes to Jesus. I don't care if they drinking, smoking, sexing around, cursing or doing all kinds of whatever. The moment that they said yes to Jesus and they have a true conversion by the spirit of God, they are spiritual. Now, spiritual maturity is a different thing. And I believe by practicing the presence of God, praying, spending time in his word, with other Christians, fellowship, going to church, all the beautiful things that God, tools that God has given us for spiritual development, I believe the person becomes spiritually mature. But the moment of conversion, I believe they became spirit, spiritual. And that's in Jesus. Nothing, no one else, Jesus. I know that to do this, your heart must be empty of all things. Because God desires to possess it exclusively without first emptying it, it of everything other than himself. Neither can he act within it nor do there what he pleases. I fully disagree. Fully disagree. But I still love Brother Lawrence. I still respect him. I don't know. I believe he was um, Catholic. I'm not sure. But I don't believe what he said here. Because one... We come as we are to Jesus. If you're watching this and you're not saved, you can come to Jesus a hot mess, just as you are. You can't clean yourself. You cannot empty your heart. You cannot get yourself right before God do anything in you. Now, he is doing a work in us when we say yes. We can best believe every one of us that have said yes is because God did a work with us. It says, while we were yet, sinners Christ died for us so that's why I have a problem with this and again it could be a play on semantics but if I'm reading this and to me this is something that may could be glaringly misinterpreted and I have to say for myself not to show brother Lawrence is wrong but because I want to explain as a reader and sharing this that I don't agree with this Okay, I don't believe we can empty ourselves. As a matter of fact, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. And this is throughout the journey in the walk with our Lord. So if we see something that is not good in our hearts towards a situation, towards a person or whatever it may be. That don't mean that God is not going to work in our heart. If we confess it, the Bible says if we confess it, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And we can be holy his and love the God with all our heart and still have struggles. But the thing about it is he each and every day is working on us. He's dealing with us. He's shaping us and molding us and making us to bring us to that already expected end. Who he already sees us as. And who we already are, but it's a process of a manifestation of that in our everyday life. 
And we are always on this journey with the Lord of spiritual maturity. We never arrive here. We're never going to be fully grown here like you did. I'm grown. You're growing. We're growing in grace, in the stature of the Lord, and in maturity in the Lord, in his knowledge, his love, his wisdom. So I believe that even with a person having all kinds of issues, and we have issues, we have struggles, he is still doing whatever he wants as he pleases in our heart. And if you're not resisting the Lord, he's doing whatever he pleases. And even those that are his and he's resisting, God is still working. Even those that are resisting God, believe me, God could flip that in a moment. And not because he's not a gentleman, but because he loves us so much. He will pull someone from, he will, he will have someone escape something and it will be a rough pull, but it will be, the whole motive behind it will be all love. And, but we can go further into that. But yeah, I just need to say that. So then he writes, there's no way of life in the world more agreeable or delightful than continual conversation with God. Yes, I love that part. Only those who practice and experience it can understand this. I do not suggest, however, that you do it for this reason. We must not seek consolation from this exercise. Must do it but must do it from a motive of love and because God wants it. I don't know. I have a problem with that. I know the motive should always be love and because God wants it. Yes, that's a definite. And we love the Lord. We say yes to him. His, he's working in us, right? If a person is praying because they need comfort, and again, he may not have meant that. Maybe it's just that, I have not dialogued with him. And I think if I was, if he, if we were face to face and he said this and I had the opportunity to ask him, I would say, what do you mean by that? I would give a question. I, I, I can't because I, I see that. Well, maybe because he said that, but it's something else he means. I, I just can't, I'm not understanding exactly what he meant. You understand what I'm saying? He said, I do not suggest, however, that you do it for this reason. I would say, like, what do you mean by that? Because I still feel unclear about that statement. We must not seek consolation from this exercise. And I'm like, well, the Bible says that God is our consolation, you know, and the Holy Spirit is a comforter. So are you saying that if you need comfort, don't go to God, don't pray just because you need comfort? I mean, if I need comfort, I'm going to pray. I don't need to worry about loving God because I already do. And he already lives in me. So, you know, see, that right there lends itself to some further conversation. But I don't, I can't talk with him. So I just need to not, I need to say, well, I don't agree with that and just move on. But I don't need to like, um, you know, mess him, um, try to, to try to trash him so to speak. I want, I, by the grace of God, I don't want to do that. And that's, I'm being very clear as I share this, because this is the first time I'm going more in depth on whether I agree or disagree with the classical writer. So he writes, if I were a preacher, I would preach nothing but the practice of the presence of God. He says, if he was a preacher, that's what he would do. And if I were a spiritual director, I would re recommend it to everyone practicing the presence of God. And he said, that's if he was a preacher, that's all he would preach. Now, I will preach that, but that's not the only thing I would preach. But that's his prerogative to feel that way, right? And he says, if I was a spiritual director, I would recommend it to everyone. Of course, I think we should recommend to everyone practicing the presence of God, like sitting in God's presence, knowing him, talking with him, praying, you know, um, being mindful of him. People are mindful of a lot of stuff. There are my practices of being mindful, but I believe be mindful of the Lord because when you mindful of the Lord, that covers a whole lot of other stuff. Then you be mindful of people. Believe me, I, the way that I, I tend by the grace of God, not to in my home, because this is what God has given me. So I can't take credit for it or take glory for it. I just have to acknowledge that this is, this is where he has me in this season and what he's done for me. The way that I'm, I've become more mindful and compassionate about people is because I've, I'm mindful of God. God made me more mindful of him. And I know if I keep transgressing against a person and I still make mistakes, I'm transgressing against God. 
because that's God's creation. If I do something to someone, I don't care if they saved or unsaved. God is looking at me and saying, what are you doing? You touching, if they are a believer, you handling the ark in an incorrect way. And if they are an unbeliever, they are my creation, regardless of where they are. I don't care if they are on the street, butt naked, stank, dirty, hair matted to their head. We have no right to mistreat another individual. God is not pleased with that. He is not pleased. So, I don't know, like... And I know this is not Samantha. Because back in the day, say something to me. <laughs> say something to me that I don't like. <laughs> say something. And God is like, now you better go pray something. <laughs> Jesus. You better go pray something. Because sometimes our flesh will come up. Say something. Say something. And God is like, oh yeah? And if they say something, what you going to do? <laughs> What you going to do? You going to go over there and pray something. That's what you going to do. In the name of Jesus, Lord, God is so good. So anyway, so he says, I will rem I will recommend it to everyone for I believe there is nothing so necessary or so easy. I believe the first part that it is truly necessary, but easy to practice the presence of God. There are so many distractions in this world. I'm telling you, sometimes it's a fight to sit down and be still. But I will say this, the more I believe, and I've experienced this, the more I enjoy God's presence, and then there's also certain things that transpire in life, it makes you. And not that you don't love God and you're going there for the wrong purpose, but it keeps you on your knees. It keeps you close to the Lord. Because you know without him, you cannot survive. And it's not like you're using God. Oh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm only with you because I need you to survive. No, don't let the devil get up in your head and think like that. God loves for us to be dependent upon him. He loves for us to rely on him and realize that there is no better thing than him. There is no greater thing in, than him. There isn't. You know that song, Nobody Greater, Nobody Greater Than You. And then there's that song by, um, I think, Jonathan Nelson, um, I'm Nothing Without You. And it's the truth. So anyway, but I, do, I don't believe it's that easy. I believe there is a warfare to keep us from praying, to keep us from being mindful of God and practicing his presence. But he is able he is faithful. He is, it, there's a scripture, it says God works in us both to will, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Meaning the desire for us to do it is not even of us. It's born of him. And then when we do it, that's him. He works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. Glory to God. Sorry about the dog barking in the background. Neighbors upstairs have a, a, dog, a little doggy. So this is the devotion I have practiced since I entered religious life. Now, I don't call it religious life. I call it faith. Christianity is a faith. However, I know the word religion is in the New Testament. It says, true religion is this, to help the um, orphan, and I believe it says the widows, but I know it's definitely the orphans, and to keep that tongue from, from, from evil. The Bible said that's true religion. So I'm like, okay, like that word religion gets a lot of beat up session, but it's there in the New Testament. But however, I also say the Christian faith. I don't say that we are a religion, but God, but in the Bible, it does say true religion is to, to help the orphans. And don't, don't quote me on this. I'm going to try to put the scripture up when I um upload the video. And um to to oh to keep us keep keep um oneself abstain from the world, to keep thank you Lord to keep oneself abstain from the Lord. So yes, from the world, not the Lord. Yikes! To keep oneself abstain from the world. Yeah. So yeah. So going back to the text, this is the devotion I have practiced since I've entered religious life. He says, although I have practiced it feebly and imperfectly, I have too. I have nonetheless received many advantages. I certainly know this is due to the Lord's mercy and goodness. I agree. And this must be acknowledged since we can do nothing 
without him. I agree. So I know that was pretty long, but I think it's it's beneficial. So know God better. Here are the scriptures. John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. That's John 14, 26. This is Psalm 16, 11. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Hmm. I want to read that in the King James Version. Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You know that song? In his presence there is fullness of joy. In your presence there are pleasures forevermore. There is a place of perfect praise with manifold blessings in store. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Yeah, I don't have the tune all together, but the words, it's the truth, right? So, and the last one, Exodus 33, 14. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Thank you, Jesus. So here are the questions. Think about it. Do you need to empty your heart of anything so that God can possess it fully? That question, I do have a problem with it. I believe God can possess a person's heart fully and they still be struggling with some things in their heart. But because we don't know everything about our heart. We just don't. We don't know. Now, can we say, I would say, you know, um, are you currently holding on to anything? And not surrendering it fully over to God. Giving God your heart fully. But. <clears throat> we don't know. We don't know certain things about us. Until we are in a situation. And. I believe God designed it like that. Because we can't handle everything. We. That's too much for us. Our soul is so deep in the things about us. As human beings. You know. We can't, you know, just imagine if you sat down and you told a person everything that was wrong with them in one shot. Would you do that to a child? If you see that they had a whole bunch of struggles, would you sit there and say, well, this is wrong with you. This is wrong with you. This is wrong with you. And this is wrong with you. This is wrong. That child will feel so condemned and feel like there's no hope. Where do you go with all of that? I know there are some things that God showed me about certain attitudes and character flaws that if I would have knew maybe seven years ago, I would not have been able to handle it. I probably would have turned I probably would have turned my back on the Lord feeling like, you know what? I'm I'm a lost cause. There's no help in me because I'm just so messed up. So some things we don't we don't know now. And it's it's okay. But God knows when it's time. He, he knows when it's time to deal with that thing and to teach us the lessons that we need to be taught. He's merciful and he's compassionate. He has pity on us because he knows that we are but dust. He's not trying to bruise us. He's not abusive. He's not, he doesn't verbally and mentally and emotionally abuse us. He's a good, good father. He's a loving father. 
So he lets us see the goodness that he works in us. And he lets us see some things that, we, you know, you need to repent of this. And by the grace of God, we can repent, confess it, repent, and he cleanses us from it. We move on and then <laughs> there's some other pruning that needs to be done to bring forth his fruit. Second question. When you converse with God, is the motive of your heart one of love? When you converse with God, is the motive of your heart one of love? Is your life one lived in the presence of God? Is your life one lived in the presence of God? Excuse me. So this is by Ruth Haley Barton. And it's called Invitation to Solitude and Silence. Invitation to Solitude and Silence. The, the insight is an excerpt from there. Ruth Haley Barton. Solitude and silence are not self-indulgent exercises for times when an overcrowded soul needs a little time to itself. Rather, they are concrete ways of openness, opening to the presence of God. I like that. You know, sometimes we need solitude and silence. It's, too, it's a lot going on. And I know for myself, and I'm going to make be a little bit more personal today. I'm like, I'm not an introvert, but I'm not an extra extrovert. Like, I, and I don't like to, I'm not going to label myself that, but I can practice both ways. But I will honestly say like, I like a more solitude and silence than I like being in crowds or being around a lot of people because I've learned throughout the years that one of the things that makes me a lot of anxious is crowds. And I don't know why it's like that. And I've prayed about it. But one of the reasons why I do know is because, let me just, should I say this, Lord? Yeah, I, I could be a little bit more personal today. Uh, I used to be a type of person that's loyal to a fault. And people used to tell me, like, Samantha, you don't see that that person is not right. Like, they're not for you. I really did not know how to discern before the Lord, you know, gave me the gift of discernment. And I would know, I would know something is wrong and I would get away from, you know, things that I felt that was dangerous as a little girl. I always would do that. But it was something between my older teens and my early 20s. It was like. And then I used to party and go out and stuff a lot. So I think that also kind of like dulled my sense of discernment because it was other stuff that I was involved in. So I wasn't, I didn't have that clarity that I had when I was much younger. But um, I realized as I got older and growing in, in the Lord that that silence and solitude I need it because I need to hear from God. I don't I don't do too well and it's too much noise. It's too much going on and I'll I don't I'll get caught up. And it's not to say I don't go in crowds. I'll go when the Lord leads me, I'll go I make some people feel like, um, hold on one second. Sometimes that makes some people feel uncomfortable. You know, I don't go to parties that is drinking and smoking because and playing like worldly music because I'm going to be sitting there looking like what the heck is going on. I, I'm not comfortable in those type of arenas anymore. But if the Lord tells me to go for whatever reason, like I would go. But I know it's like it's for the express purpose of him having me there because, you know, he may want me to connect with someone or share something with someone or someone share something with me. I don't know. I don't just I can't just take it upon myself to be like, oh, I'm going. No, no, I can't. And so. And then I, the Lord has me praying a lot. And I believe as part of my giftings and my call to, to know how to practice the presence of God. And, you know, and people that love me, that genuinely love me, they, are, they get that about me. They get that about me. So last but not least, Bruce Wilkinson from The Secrets of the Vine. Bruce Wilkinson from Secrets of the Vine. God didn't want me to do more for him. This is my favorite insight right here. He wanted me to be more with him. I was like, I was like, oh, when I read that, I was like, yes, Lord. 
God didn't want me to do more for him. He wanted me to be more with him. And one day, because it's time to go, it's been, I've been here on here for a moment. One day, I'm going to share why this insight. It was like, it was like, I'm, I can echo him. I can echo him. I can echo him this from my heart. God didn't want me to do more for him. He wanted me to be more with him. He didn't want me to be a Martha, Martha. Martha, Martha, you were troubled about many things. But Mary, she's chosen the better part. She's practicing the presence of God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Give him the glory. Practicing the presence of God. So let's take a moment. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so that's it. I'm going to say thanks for watching. God bless you. And remember, Jesus loves you. Practice the presence of God.